Welcome to the Big Picture Skiing Podcast, and on today's show, we're gonna talk with Christoph Lentz. Now, Christoph is the product manager for Fisher, and he's in charge of the entire boot range from little kid ski boots all the way to World Cup athletes. So he has an incredible wealth of knowledge for that whole entire range, and so great to hear from someone that understands what goes into boots of all ability levels. Now, I think of real interest in this uh, chat is Christoph's personal story he was a ski racer, and you'll hear about how he came across the Fisher brand and how it actually led to some success. You'll hear about boot testing, prototype testing, and also like the fact that Christoph skis in all the competitors' boots as well as his own, and so he has a really like detailed feel for what sort of plastics, buckle placements, cuff alignment, all sorts of things, ramp angle, how that affects and creates a different feel in a boot. So I think it's amazing to speak to someone with such like experience across such a wide variety of boots. On top of that, I think it's really interesting to hear about the technologies Fisher uses to develop and sort of get their own cutting edge with ski boots, as well as find out that some of the best skis in the world are not using super, super stiff boots. Anyway, I'll leave the rest for the show. I hope you enjoy this episode with Christoph Lentz, product manager for Fisher. Christoph, product manager for Fisher Boots, thank you for joining. Hey, let's just get stuck into it. Like, what's what's your background? How did you end up being in that role? What's your involvement? Where did you start in the whole ski world? Yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me on. Um, nice to chat. Um, I used to come from a racing background growing up in Park City, Utah, um, and I got involved with the Fisher brand in late 2009. Um, I made the switch from Nordica originally, and that's uh, was looking for a, a new brand to work with and was drawn to Fisher because of the skis primarily, um, and primarily the slalom skis. I was a bit more of a slalom specialist at that time. And uh, yeah, uh, had a lot of success with the skis. But at the same time, uh, I was advised by my coaches to really not take the Fisher boot. And this was in the, the early days of the first real Fisher race boots, uh, the RC4 Pro. Um, and they, for several reasons basically advised me not to and that ended up with me being in a, a lang boot um, and skiing in a z b z c kind of mixture um, frankenstein boot uh, for one year before i got introduced to my first fisher boot and there was a local race rep um, it was around the time that fisher was uh, coming to market with the the vacuum technology and he offered me a free boot um, basically to practice uh, the vacuum fitting before he was doing any of the U.S. ski team guys who were also based in Park City. Um, and I always found it a little bit embarrassing to be skiing a, a blue Lang boot paired with a black and yellow combination. And so I was immediately, of course, jazzed to, to get into a yellow boot. Um, all, I mean, free product is cool, but there was also kind of a, uh, a desire to have something that looked and matched optically better. Um, and so long story short, I got this boot. The coaches were kind of like, eh, it's risky in the middle of the season to make a switch. And a few weeks later, I won my first slalom race, scored my first sub 30 point fist result. And after that, it was never a question. And so that to me, um, even then, with a, was still being an athlete and not having any aspirations of being uh, uh, in the industry professionally, uh, made clear to me that the, the product worked, um, but also emphasized that there's some of these stigmas on the market um, that really can, can prevent and limit the success of a brand and um, also limit athletes from getting onto something that might work just because there are some preconceived notions and uh, yeah, maybe some things aren't understood. Um, fast forward about 10 years, um, I had raced in college. Um, I skied for Williams College, raced NCAA, did a stint working in finance um, in the tech area, lived in Manhattan and San Francisco, 
and yeah, it made good money, but wasn't feeling so fulfilled, let's say, and decided I wanted to, to make a, a switch back to something where I felt more passionate about, um, and that being, for me, skiing. Um, aided by the fact that my mother is German, she's from Garmisch-Partenkirchen, I have German citizenship, I speak German, so there was a lot of things that kind of came together and it was a fateful, fortunate, um, pretty spontaneous switch where there was a role open, I was interested in moving to Europe, um, I had a ski racing background and was a passionate skier, um, and luckily the, the Alpine division leader here in Austria um, took a chance on me and yeah um, the rest is kind of that was about three years ago and so been cutting my teeth on the other side of of things now since then yeah cool I think it's so interesting that story about like a changing equipment and you suddenly you know could found found your feet and you you won a race like that's not unusual. Um, I mean, you, and I think it really isn't speaking to, you know, one brand being better. It's just that when people have stigmas about certain things, it might be because that, you know, everyone's different and that shape just doesn't work for them, but they shouldn't be projecting that on, on others. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's certain, I know you're a, a, a tech nerd and like, like the, the, the details and the, the technical side of things. And there's certain, some elements, um, every brand is doing a little bit different and has some, some unique things that may or may not work for a given athlete. Um, but there's, and then of course, when we're talking about ski boots, I mean, fit is critical. Um, it is the, the, the most direct piece of equipment you're in contact with and that's your 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 control um, of the whole system but on the same side for me I think there is a bit of a, a mental game and dare say a bit of a placebo effect there of I feel confident with my setup it may not be the empirically fastest best setup but if I am standing there in the start gate saying this is I've got something good. This works for me. I'm confident. I'm liking this. Um, that is a tangible effect that'll that'll make you ski faster. So for me, that was also like I was standing with my chest a little higher, being like, "Hey, look at this! I got like everything is color coordinated matching. now and matching, and like I feel good." And so then you're yeah, going to take the second run with after a, a good first run, and you're saying like, "Watch out, everybody! Like I I got this." And there's no really doubt as it, yeah, am I in the right setup? Is the equipment working for me? So I think you, you see it on both sides. Um, yeah. And- do you think, do you think though, have you thought back now that you know a lot more of the technical side of boots, there are actually some more tangible things that, that the Fisher boot perhaps worked in favor for you or the, uh, or the Lang didn't? Yeah. I mean, um, it's hard hard saying i mean from the fit um i got along well with the the fisher last at that time that was the original 95 millimeter um last that they had developed um i had i got some pretty bad instep bone spurs that unfortunately exist to this day from being in the lang for those two years so it just didn't work perfectly for my for my foot um but on the other end um I think one of the big things was was vacuum plastic um, that that existed at that time, which I know some of the the race coaches were a little bit skeptical of, um, and it was a a new new technology that Fisher had developed. Um, it is a little bit of a different feeling, has a different bit of a rebound, um, and for me, I'm a tall, generally skinny, lanky guy, and I'm not a full power skier. Um, and I skied a lot with, with touch. Um, and so the ability to be dynamic, flex, move through the boot um, definitely uh, was a benefit to me. And um, looking back on it too, I think that that was a plastic, um, that was a boot that especially going from flat to steep rollovers allowed you to be dynamic, get over the ski. I think if you're in a concrete block of a boot, um, which some coaches are, are, are convinced is the best, best 
best thing to be in. Um, it does limit the the ability of some athletes to 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 be dynamic and um, yeah. ultimately ski their fastest. I remember you in a conversation before we were talking about you 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 speak to some of the Fisher athletes on the World Cup, and you're not going to mention names or anything, but you know, the, do you want to maybe speak to some of them and what they like in some of their boots? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the standard PU is, is been on the, the world cup and has kind of been the, the, the core of what gets skied across most brands. Um, we do have, uh, Fisher athletes that have had success skiing with um, derivatives of this vacuum plastic and um, yeah really the the takeaway for me and talking with them and especially their servicemen is to to this is exactly what I just said here um, the ability to to be dynamic to flex to get a boot that works um, that is got some movement some cuff rotation um, instead of the kind of standard or um, really typical, stiff. really stiff where there's no movement and you're pressing against something that's um, giving absolute no, no movement or marginal movement. Um, and I've been blown away when I see some of the mixtures being skied that are, um, I dare say, in the direction of a 110, 120 flex, where you would expect a guy of that power um, and with that kind of real world cup success on some of the hardest tracks out there, um, that they would be skiing something much stiffer. I think that's kind of a stereotype we build in our heads and a and, lot of the and coaches just so we're clear here, like what discipline would that um, be in? Uh, especially in tech. Um, we, we yeah, had okay. some, some, some guys doing it, which is a surprise. Uh, the general rule is that the tech boots are stiffer than the mm. than the than the speed boots um speed wanting a little bit more of a supple uh glidey feel with uh less directness but even in these tech disciplines and especially solemn to see that some guys are skiing um softer than you would expect um and uh also skiing these these vacuum based mixtures that that do allow um, quite a bit of movement. So I think there's, there's quite a bit, um, yeah, more oh. detail in that, that happens there. And the, the common stereotype, the better you ski, the stronger you get, the stiffer your boot needs to be. I think, um, unfortunately, uh, there is a lot of people who are skiing in a, in a, or are overbooted and are mm -hmm. skiing something that doesn't allow them to be as dynamic um, as they could be. And it's an actual detriment to their performance and ultimately to their speed. I think I was surprised. I mean, it's not just people competing on the World Cup. You like, there's athletes that have podiumed one in these setups we're talking about. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. You it's, wouldn't it's really necessarily cool. expect it, but um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of one of the, the privileges of my position and um, one of the things that's been really fun for me as a ex ski racer, as a passionate skier and wanting to be, um, I've made peace with the fact that my, my athletic career is, is, is gone and that I'm, I will not be winning any world cups, but to be in proximity and chat and kind of understand enough and have enough context to see like what it concerns and for, for those guys, I mean, I think this placebo effect or just this general confidence that comes from, hey, I'm in something maybe different than other people, and that gives me yeah. an advantage. Everybody else is, is, is sticking to kind of the script and maybe let's try something different. Um, and that that is, is that also has why maybe a mental like, effect. Yeah, and also partly what, like why you're not allowed, why you can't mention names because yeah, it's I mean, part of that is like this sort of secret, but like maybe secret source kind of stuff that, and if it's placebo, who, who cares? Placebo is great. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I need to kind of respect the, the race R and D guys. Um, I not, uh, yeah, in the, in the, the, the core of the, the race boot development. Um, my, my goal is a little more to, to commercialize and help the rest of the market understand and to, 
to help the brand at large. Uh, the race department has one goal and only one goal, and that's not to build nice boots, but that's to make athletes go fast and win. Um, and they're constantly, constantly tinkering. Um, I, I don't know the, the latest info of what was being skied on the glacier uh, last month, but um, they're constantly iterating and trying out new things. And we definitely make a ton of prototype boots and athletes test a lot of wild ideas as well. And most of them uh, don't end up coming to market or don't end up being the, the thing that, that brings them further. But in, in a number of cases, yeah, there's, there's things that uh, run contrary to maybe the, the common understanding or these common beliefs that uh, stiff or narrower, um, always PU, um, that is the tried and true way to, to win. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was, for me, eye-opening to see that there are um, certain, certain athletes that have found success with something that... Um, that people just don't see. And at the end of the day, yeah. they're all yellow boots coming out of uh, same or similar molds and the modifications. I mean, uh, it is a, it is a competitive sport and there is also the, the, the goal to keep things, uh, yeah, keep things confidential to make sure that, yeah, we don't give up all of our secrets. Yeah. Yeah. So then let's jump into like more what you're involved with, like the biggest section of skiers that like that probably a lot of ones listening here. So you're, you're involved in developing, testing that sort of boot, correct? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my, my goal, my mission, my, my assignment is really to uh, bring to market a successful international ski boot collection which means um, I'm not developing for one market. Um, I, of course, have American roots and I'm working for a, an Austrian company. But and this means balancing the needs of North America with Central Europe um, and taking into account really what can we do to, to, to promote the brand and really bring, bring a successful collection. Um, this spans from kids' boots um, and we've done quite a bit in the, the last years in terms of innovating in this area, all the way up to taking what is being developed by our World Cup R&D team and bringing this to the masses, having conversations with folks like yourself to, to increase the understanding and promote the brand. Um, but on a day-to-day, -day, I, I sit in the headquarters in Ried im Inkreis here in Upper Austria, uh, which is one of the main ski factory or where we have the location of one of our primary ski factories. And I, yeah, um, sit between all the other divisions um, within the organization. So that includes sales, uh, making sure they know what we have, what to sell, um, coordinating the samples, the order schedule, making sure that um, everything is defined so that when the sales orders come in, this can be made um, with the operations, logistics, purchasing um, departments, and especially in current times with supply chains being what they are. I mean, there's a lot of work and um, things happen extremely far in advance in terms of planning for raw materials, reserving production capacity, and really trying to to organize a plan to make sure that um, the boots arrive in the store uh, as intended, um, sitting with marketing to say, here, we've developed something cool and new. Um, here's what we can talk about. Um, the marketing folks are not necessarily so in detail on all the nitty gritty product things. Um, but at the same time, we're tasked with having a market overview. So viewing what is happening on the competitors, who is bringing what, um, what is working well, um, and then also having a connection to the market and to the dealers to say uh, what, what has been selling well, what has been, what is, what troubles are out there, what are the problems you are facing dealing with the end consumer every day. Um, all the way through finance and and really the whole invest side. Um, and I'm grateful to work for a company that is so committed to the 
investment on the boot side. Um, and it's uh, compared to, to ski production. I mean, the molds we build for a ski boot are, are very expensive. And so there is quite a bit of trust and commitment from the, from the brand to, to, to spend this money. Um, in Are you allowed advance. to say what, what like a, you know, one size, like a 26.5 boot mold, new one to create roughly costs? Uh, let's say it's at least 10 times more just to make a shell than it costs to make an entire ski mold. And you're talking really just there wow. about the shell mold. And we're talking tens of thousands of euros um, where the every every other little part, whether it's the water protector mold, whether it's the um, the Zeppa, the the boot board, all of these are then separate tools that need to get built um, and then need to to be yeah injected to be to be used to produce the actual piece that that that, uh, that arrives in the box. Um, and then keeping in mind that we have size runs of nine, 10, 11, 12 sizes per yeah. a given concept. So it's not just um, a one-time investment you're making this, uh, then you've got cuff molds, you've got to develop buckles, there's the strap, and then of course, everything that goes into a liner. So um, <laughs> I, having spent most of my life in knee boots, um, seemingly, and never really given any consideration to how does this thing come to be and um yeah we're, we've got a lot of things in the pipeline but when you sit in front of the 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 computer screen and we're we're drawing in 3d the the new concept there are i dare say thousands of decisions that need to be get that get made and is do we need a half a millimeter more here or there and so to really kind of um, coordinate the whole organization to say, this is the target. We are developing something for specifically this group. We are competing against these boots. Um, we need to hit this price target. Uh, we need to have these features or mm, often not even, we need to have these features. These are the problems we are trying to solve. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, yes. it's massively more complex than <laughs> I ever thought, but uh, yeah. I am not, Board. good fun um, fun challenge right yeah yeah it's uh it helps that i enjoy skiing i enjoy the sport and um i really enjoy the community and the 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 people who are the course scene who is really engaged about it um yeah. i'm invested in trying to bring the sport to to more people and ultimately develop boots that fit well that make for a better more enjoyable ski experience um and so exactly my role is uh gives me the ability to do that but um yeah it's it's not given that that just happens automatically yeah i must say like i've had a great experience in being in a in, in a brand and then uh tried the fisher vacuum that that 150 flex 95 mil one and had an immediate great sort of experience with it like my all the things I was trying to do technically as an instructor suddenly became easier and then on like down the line being able to modify it and, and make it comfortable was really simple so I, I thought the vacuum uh, plastic was was a really cool innovation so maybe you want to speak about you know the the history because you mentioned it's not just wasn't developed just to be customizable and moldable there are other factors at play there and maybe even uh, where that technology is today versus when i first got those boots yeah um i mean uh vacuum is the is the commercial name that we've given to this this polymer and it's a, a high-tech polymer that we've developed and it's ex exclusive and proprietary to fisher um, and really intended for use in ski boots. And we focused on really um, emphasizing and developing something that had, in our opinion, superior material properties. Um, at the time it came to market in the late 2009, 2010, 2011 stage, um, as we were rolling it out, um, Fisher was not as 
um, let's say, did not have such a wide collection um, where we had lots of different concepts with many different lasts. So one of the key goals was to develop something that was customizable. Um, if you only have one fit and you're trying to fit a wide range of feet into it, um, the, the rather innovative and clever solution was to find a material that was easily adaptable to make that boot fit as many feet as possible. Um, and to that extent, um, we targeted something that had a low temperature for, for thermal molding, let's say, um, with a high degree of memory effect. So there's certain materials that do not hold a shape so well. And um, we've, we've managed to develop something here that has a very good memory effect that will hold um, a shape. It is- Yeah, it's becomes... incredible like that. I, I have, sorry, but I have to say that, that part, like, yeah, it's incredible. I've never seen a boot that can do that as easily. Yeah, um, uh, you see a lot of other materials, some of the lighter weight, um, really stiff polyamids, PAs being used in touring boots have exactly not this property um, where you, you have a hard time getting it to hold a punch. Um, you need to, to be very diligent to, to get that to work. Um, vacuum is, is in contrast, uh, yeah, has a strong memory effect. Um, helped by the fact that it has a low, uh, a, it becomes moldable at a relatively low temperature. So we communicate about 65 degrees, it starts to become thermomoldable. Um, all of our standard vacuum ovens to, to heat the boots are set at 80 degrees, but um, this is well within the working range of where it becomes thermomoldable. But once you cool it back down to room temperature, uh, it does hold this shape very nicely. So this was kind of one of the first goals was to do this. In the process, we tried to reduce weight as well. So we, we managed to reduce weight, let's say by about 15% compared to a conventional PU, um, which was a nice benefit um, and can help make a difference. Um, part of what has made the material successful on the, the commercial market as well. Um, to some of the to our earlier chats or a few minutes ago talking about yeah, being able to move, um, we find that this material really has better vibration dampening. So it has a different elasticity um, that translates into maybe a different, different flex pattern, but it is um, a very dynamic plastic that, that works, works well, um, but might take a little bit of getting used to. And one of the kind of second results or final results that we noticed coming out of it as well is that vacuum compared to a conventional PU has um, extremely good temperature stability. So when we <clears throat> look at the E modulus or basically the, the, um, the hardness of the plastic measured empirically um, at let's say 20 degrees Celsius, um, we're similar and that being a, a very warm temperature, warmer yeah. than is usually being skied. We have about the same stiffness as a, as a PU, the same E module. But as you start to decrease the temperature, um, once you get to, let's say, minus five to seven degrees Celsius, uh, the difference in E modulus between a vacuum plastic and a, P, a conventional PU starts to become much uh, different. So the, uh, the PUs get much, much harder as soon as it starts to get cold. And if you look at minus 20 degrees, we have a pretty small range of increase in hardness through that temperature change, whereas a conventional PU becomes really, really stiff. Um, seen the other way, that's why you see on the World Cup, a lot of the uh, people skiing the standard plug PU boots when it's warm out need to get that coldness and they wrap their boots in snow to really yeah. to get it to stay cold. Stiffen it up. Yeah. And so, yeah, the temperature stability um, 
in short and in layman's terms means that the flex of the boot stays much more consistent over a decrease in temperature, whereas a PU becomes progressively and progressively stiffer as it gets colder. And have you found that, because I know uh, like there's been some changes more recently in terms of, I don't know, the, the durability or how, where, what's happening in different parts of the boots, I should say, it's maybe modified yeah. so the boot lasts longer. Yeah, um, I th- can't say exactly, but I mean, we're on at least iteration number seven of this mixture. Um, it's something that we compound ourselves and are constantly tweaking with. Um, initial boots did have a, um, the downside of being rather prone to ripping and being not quite so durable. So we've done a number of things, including adding um, glass fibers to, to reinforce it. Um, and so we feel like we've gotten the durability and any kind of of these shell ripping problems that plagued earlier reasons very much in control. Um, and which is why we feel very comfortable putting this into um, our commercial boots and yeah. mass market boots um, that, that, yeah, where it doesn't concern hundreds of seconds either. But because of all these benefits that were really developed um, with, with World Cup racing in mind. Um, so this is continuing to be a process. We continue to iterate on it and it's, a, it's, it's one of uh, our, our areas of innovation where we want to, yeah, continue to, to raise the bar there um, to the point that I started on <clears throat> where we had one last 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and we needed to be incredibly adjustable. Um, we're now offering boots, um, and especially commercially in many different fits for many different target groups. And so the ability to have a huge degree of adjustment has become less emphasized simply because our boots fit better out of the box. Um, we don't need to compensate, let's say as much with a material that is as adjustable. Um, and so we can go for something that is um that has perhaps a little bit less adjustability but uh maintains these lightweight temperature stable characteristics um while still being moldable but uh that we don't need to to go overboard in terms of the vacuum process let's say yeah and yeah what's your are you allowed to talk about the your current little project which is sort of a bit of uh, like one for you, isn't it? Like the, 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 the boot you may be looking at developing, are you allowed to talk about that one? Um, me, not quite. Um, okay. <laughs> well, yeah, we've got, we've got a number of things in the works. Um, what I can say is we are committed to the, the vacuum plastic. And this is something that we see as part of um, Fisher's DNA. And it's something that we're, we're proud of what we've achieved here. And we've gotten good market feedback here. Um, but of course, yeah, we're working on new concepts, um, trying to learn from uh, past models and, and, and stay in line with the market. Um, but yeah, we are targeting boots that enable high performance skiing um, that, are, that fit well and that, that really strike, strike the balance of performance and and an all day enjoyable ski experience, um, which uh, in the past might not have always been a strength of Fisher. But uh, other than that, I'd say, uh, yeah, stay tuned. There's, there's a lot of things in the pipeline and I'm super excited to, 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 to present a lot of new stuff in the, in the coming season. What's, what's the boot you're, you was, you've been skiing in, uh, in the last maybe couple of seasons? What do you like? Um, since I should I've, say, how do you ski now? Like, are you do you ski just off piste now, or what do you what do you like? Do you still like to rip a groomer? Uh, I mean, I love to rip a groomer. I I think if if when whenever we get the chance to go on snow, I definitely cannot hide the fact that I have a race background, and um, yeah, you won't mistake me for a, a park skier necessarily in terms of trying to maximize edge angle. 
Um, in my role, I, I mean, I ski every boot in the collection and I ski every boot from all of our competitors um, just to, 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 to have that internal benchmark. Um, I, I have a, a podium RD race boot that I use when, when especially here in Europe, um, when it's cold and the, the piste, is, piste is great and maybe it hasn't snowed in a while. Um, but since moving to Europe and being in the Alps, I spend a lot of time in our touring boots as well. Um, we have two very strong touring boot concepts, the Traverse and the Transalp most recently. Um, the Traverse being very uphill oriented under a thousand grams and the Transalp wow. being a little more downhill oriented. Um, when you look at what we have in the backyard here, um, it's a lot of uh very technical um steep and generally long tours um with quite a bit of alpine uh exposure so that's been really exciting for me to maybe spend a little less time in race boots and kind of push these other boundaries um but i also have a, a ranger which is kind of our 50 50 multi-performance boot with tech inserts that um, strikes this this balance between um, skiability, walkability, and uh, above all enables uh, uh, com compatibility with with the most number of bindings. Um, so yeah, I have the luxury. Yeah, that we are also constantly you have to choose it for what it, what actually that you choose the best boot for the day, right? It's not yeah. yeah. I don't ski the same boot back to back that often. Um, so we're yeah, constantly changing. I think to a large degree, I, I look at, well, I mean, are we going touring or are we riding lifts? Um, what ski am I taking? What binding am I going to take? And then uh, what can I, what can I learn from this day of skiing, whether it's a new, new liner, a new modification on a liner, whether it's a, a new plastic mixture, whether it's a new buckle closure um, configuration, um, I'm constantly trying to use every every ski day to 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 check something out. Um, I love to ski so, A B different boot on the left and right. Um, oh yeah, to, I've never done that. That that must be a very effective way in like really discerning the exact like differences. Yeah, uh, I think there's different opinions to it. Um, depends on, I guess, kind of your experience and your baseline. I think if you're very used to one particular setup, it might be a little bit strange. Um, it's definitely a pretty cerebral experience. I think you have to think um, and be pretty mentally uh, tuned into what you're feeling. And yeah. then um, for me is also not basing... Um, not making jumping to conclusions based off a single day of trying to say we ski i skied this um in these conditions it was this this temperature out um i'm often skiing with a uh a digital temperature gun measuring shell temperatures to say um but there's so many little unique modifications and uh we have a number of kind of uh spare part or accessories to customize whether it's a volume reducer whether it's uh, an adjustment to the boot board um, whether it's uh, a liner modification um, even if I don't need it to, to understand the impact this has and again assist me in kind of helping communicate this to the to the wider audience yeah I mean I'd imagine at, like the you being the boot guy, you you probably find it very hard to not be out there skiing and thinking about the elements in the boot. Just like when I go out, I'm always thinking about technique and looking at other people's technique. You, you must be stuck there with, with the boots. Like you'd probably have such good feeling of just getting like, oh, wow, this buckle is is lower than, you know, the previous one because I can feel it in the flex and oh. And, it's actually cut, like taking my leg in this direction. All these things that people that don't ski a variety of boots and think about it would just miss. Yeah, um, there's there's yeah a, a huge huge rabbit hole of things, and I mean a lot of uh, things being tried. 
from other competitors and whatnot, but it's a similar like a, your example of you're always looking at different different techniques and kind of tuned into that. Um, when I stand in the lift line, I am constantly just looking at everybody else's boot and um, to the to the detriment or probably to the annoyance of the people who go skiing with me where I'm all like, oh, look at that. Look at that. That's a Strolz boot. You don't, you don't see that other day or that's a first generation Hawks. Like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And so, yeah, uh, for me, it's yeah. Trying to constantly absorb. Like, like a, maybe one thing, uh, you know, in the, with, with, uh, with my GT podium boots, I can change the back of the boot like the spine this one too and i can put in a different insert here to have the cuff uh rotation sort of sitting on a different angle i haven't really played with that but what would i what would i expect like would would i feel the where my tibia like my lower leg tracks will be quite like it'll be noticeably different between the the three different settings i can put it on yeah, um, I mean, that generation of boot, I must say we don't have it in all of our boots anymore in the latest version of the of the podium. Um, we've we've gotten rid of that um, for certain reasons. Um, the the concept there was to basically have the rotation of the cuff available in addition to the tipping or the cuff canting, let's say, um, the cuff alignment. The goal was, and I, I can't really make some general statement to what it does um, for everybody. Um, it has a lot to do with your lower leg uh, anatomy. Characteristics, and, yeah. And so if you've got a certain amount of knock need or bow leggedness, um, it's something that we, we had original success with to try to match that. And if you think about doing a shell fit and um, having the, the leg centered within the cuff, um, it was a, definitely a, an addition uh, to an additional lever you can pull to, to try to adapt it. Um, we found that with that generation of what we called sort of 3D um, cuff alignment to be able to rotate in addition to um, yeah, tipping Lateral it. Tipping, yeah. Exactly. Um, it was a little bit complex. And as I think this, this, this conversation might allude to or this, this comment, I mean, it's hard to explain exactly what it'll do writ large. Um, it's one of those things that needs to be checked. Um, we have a lot of people that prefer it um, and that have found that it works for a specific problem. And maybe especially in a somebody with an injury or really uh, a big difference left and right um, of, of a way to adapt further. Um, yes. But in a end effect, the, the latest generation of the podium boots with a simple uh, double rivet in the back, we found that for, for racing purposes, this offered the maximum power transfer. Um, and in effect, having that backbone, that metal insert, resulted in a huge negative space in the in the plastic which even though the piece okay. was made out of metal uh we're losing a little bit of the directness the precision and the power transfer and uh the goal of the latest version of the rd development was to to reduce tolerances and make it as tight and as stable as possible. Another big difference you'll notice is the boot you have in your hands has a big gap right here, yeah, yeah. which was required to make that cuff be able to turn. We needed the, the clearance to, to accommodate different positions. Yep. And uh, what we found and has been validated on the World Cup that the, that the the fastest skiing was actually achieved through having this gap closed. So on these boots, it is completely uh, seated against itself. And that provides above all stability to the rear and yeah. reducing tolerance. So um, yeah, I mean, speaks to kind of Fisher's innovative uh, DNA and the willingness to try new things um, and go in a different direction. Um, but yeah. 
it doesn't mean it was a bad idea, but uh, we've we've moved on from that now. Um, for yeah, in a the reasons mentioned, style of boot. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Because I remember listening to Bodie Miller talk about like in a turn, like through the end of the turn, as the boot is flexing, it's actually making the ski like like a boot's flex will either make the ski go more on edge, create higher edge angles, stay the same, or actually re- reduce it. So I'd imagine those things will like affect as it's flexing, you know, do you get more edge? Does it, does it reduce? Does it stay the, stay the same? So you can probably play with that if you're. Yeah. I think when we're, thing. when we're developing a boot from the ground up, I mean, there's a lot of consideration given to where you, where you mount the cuff um, mm. and how the boot drives as you flex forward and, um, depending on what you're in, I mean, and depending on your anatomy, but, um, our, our kind of rule of thumb is to try to try to divide, develop something that drives over the big toe. So slightly, um, in, 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 which, um, has been proven really from world cup experience that this is what has given the, the most power control, um, power transfer. Um, whereas, some other boots will you'll notice will collapse or drive a little bit more outside um yeah yeah our our yeah. philosophy is that but um like we say we kind of are constantly iterating that and who knows what the the latest set of prototypes that the that the world cup guys are are trying and yeah i mean they they also get custom made things to to try maybe something new so i don't think many people know about this and even myself it was a more recent discovery so this part of the boot which we'll call the rail i think i've heard that's what it's called it's bottom part that inserts into the binding where that is placed relative to the rest of the boot and so where my foot would be sitting brands and even within a line of boots that can be different right? It can be, you can either have more big toe basically hanging off or little toe hanging off. Would you be able to speak to that? Because I know you will have uh, skied in boots, you know, you've tested competitors boots, all that sort of stuff. Like what effect does that have for you feeling wise or what, what might people experience with that? Yeah. Um, I rail. I also sometimes refer to as the lug. Um, and we're talking here about, um, essentially where the boot is positioned relative to the ski. Um, and especially, I mean, the leading edge of most boot development here is, um, at least in our world, um, centered around racing and power transfer, um, grip control, and then generally the, the agility, yeah, hard injected snow, um, so it is something, it's not a, a modification that most boot fitters do. Um, in theory, it can be tinkered with, but that's, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty risky thing. And you can <laughs> risk really trashing a pair of boots and taking it outside of the binding norm. So um, the, the, the shape of the, the lug or the rail is defined by the ISO norms. We of course need to respect those to make sure that the boot fits and is 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 safe with with the approved binding type. But the general position um, it can have a big effect. We we know from evaluating and testing other competitors' boots, there are certain brands that tend to put the the lug more uh, medially or more with like you say more big toe hanging on the inside, which you can imagine (coughs) just intuitively, um, the more the boot is standing off to the inside of the ski and the binding, the quicker you can roll it over. But um, conversely, you can move this in the development further out, having more pinky toe off of the uh, outside edge of the ski and here you increase the leverage and increase the the amount of potential power you have to 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 tip tip the ski over 
but you lose a bit of the, the quickness. Um, in ours, we found a, a solution that works to us. Um, and uh, this is different for boot line and is more or less calibrated to um, the target group we're, 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 we're going after with a given development. Um, I mean, it goes in a similar line and I definitely have to probably mention the word Soma Tech, um, which was one of the initial Fisher innovations um, in this regard. Um, there is the lateral uh, shift. Where do you position this? Um, and then there's also what it, angle is it at? So is there any um, abduction to the stance? Um, all boots are abducted slightly, meaning uh, toes are out. You're not standing completely um, yeah, parallel to, parallel, to, yeah, this, yeah. to the ski. Um, you're always, and I mean, if you stand and you get into any sort of athletic stance, you realize that you are not standing completely parallel straight. There is a bit of toe out. Um, that's just how, how our bodies have developed. Um, Fisher, uh, back in the, in the early 2000s, really came with this Soma Tech innovation, which was um, to, to keep this toe out, which was not an innovation, but to, to tinker a little bit with where we turned the, turned the lug from. So most uh, manufacturers at the time were turning from the bottom of the heel out, and Fisher's innovation was to turn from the center of the boot, which in effect put a little bit more of the heel inside. And again, it needs to be said that we're talking here about millimeters um, or even fractions of millimeters, and but it does have a big effect and that kind of flows through the whole boot and it even impacts kind of when we're talking about cuff alignment and where the boot drives. If, if this is a red, this is something that's set, everything else is, is built on that foundation. Um, and to, to link back to my story at the beginning of the, of the chat with Lang, I mean, and the coach is advising me not to ski a Fisher boot. Um, this was probably one of the main reasons uh, the, the race scene and at least the coaches that I was working with at that time were not fans of the idea of Soma Tech and this uh, heel in. Um, maybe it was a communication problem for me. Uh, it worked very well. And so we've uh, reduced it in our communication and um, yeah, reduced some of the most extreme um, instances of it. Uh, we basically say we, we are including it in our development to, to the appropriate degree. So um, like I say, we are calibrating kind of this position per, per boot concept to make sure it fits the target group. But um, it's an interesting point to think about, especially for a consumer or a boot fitter. Um, and even if it's just a theoretical um, thing to think about, but um, to keep in mind that, yeah, try different boots may yeah. work for you. It may not work for you. Um, yeah. If you're, if you're uh, I dare say a hater or don't like the idea of the, the Soma Tech, Rest assured, uh, we've definitely dialed it way back from the days where it was a super polarizing topic, and I don't get many questions about it anymore. But to some fundamental degree, um, we are are baking um, a certain amount of this into it um, to really get empirical answers and to know per boot model, um, you really need to to do some comparisons and do some yeah. measurements to figure out what it is. But uh, yeah, I think the, the real message here is it's not something the, that needs to be considered in the buying position, in the buying decision. It's uh, something that we've done a lot of uh, homework on and, and tinkered with to get it to a place that we think works for the widest range of skiers that fits the needs of that boot um, <clears throat> to, to make that ski experience as, as good as possible. Yeah, I've been, I was pretty fascinated by it because I just like getting into the, the little details. I think I was telling you how I was playing with just rolling like a piece of 
like wood that had a curve on it. And I was playing with like where I positioned my foot on the rail and, and then also the heel, if the heel was overhung a little bit or the ball, the foot. And it's like uh, in that little experiment, I could totally like feel it, like the millimeter difference. And it's just leverage, right? Just where's the pivot point and where's the load. And uh, so I think, cause I got rid of canting in boots since I got, went into Fisher vacuum boots and the, I'm, I'm pretty sure those 150s, when I look at them, the, the, they've got a decent amount of, of that heel in. Yep. And I think that that allowed me, and uh, you know, again, maybe it's just your anatomy, where my heel is relative to the rest of the foot. I think it just put my heel in a better spot on the edge so I could just stand there without doing some weird movement. Bam, pressure to the edge. My ta- the tails just stopped slipping out. That was as simple as it was. Like my tails mm. just gripped without me having to lean, really press hard. I could just stand centered and, and it gripped. So um, yeah, I think it's probably got to, so if you're the kind of person whose heel is, I don't know, whatever, skinny or sits really close to the edge already in a boot, it's probably too much. You can't, you know, the tail, maybe you can't even release it. Um, but yeah, I think it's just interesting for people to realize that in boots, between brands, between models, that is played with. And, and because of leverage, that, that has an effect on how that boot feels. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, it was something I hadn't given much thought to until yeah, you're kind of sitting in front of a blank canvas and yeah, you get the question of, so how do we position this thing? And um, in our, in our, in our role, we have the ability to, to drive different things out. And of course, um, I'm not the only person skiing or testing these boots. We have a wide panel of international, um, skiers of all ability. And so we're constantly trying to get feedback there. And, um, there's definitely, uh, too much of a good thing, but, um, I'm really happy with the boots we, have in the collection today and the new boots that um we have in the pipeline that um yeah we've considered this and it's not just uh, a copy and paste necessarily always of what's been what's been done in the past that we're constantly reevaluating this and and looking at it in context of everything else that has changed um in the mold set in the in the in the shell geometry yeah great well, Christoph, I think that's uh, covered a lot of just questions I had anyway about ski boots and uh, the sorts of things that are involved in developing a Fisher boot in particular. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to to mention in uh, in finishing up. Um, no, uh, I enjoyed the chat. Um, I'm always um, yeah happy to talk ski boots. Um, if I don't know the answers to given questions, I'm in a position where I can help figure them out. Um, I also to, to your audience, to, to other boot fitters out there, to other consumers who are, have questions about this stuff. Um, yeah, happy to assist. And, um, I live and breathe this stuff pretty much every day, all year long. Um, and I'm happy to do so. So, uh, I'm on social media, um, and, uh, mainly on Instagram, Christoph Lentz. Uh, if you've got any questions, want to chat boots, um, feel free to reach out. Um, don't be shy. And yeah, uh, hopefully we can, I would love to come down under one day. Um, yeah. We'll see uh, when we can, when we can get that on the program. Uh, it'd be fun right. to make some turns together. Um, if you ever find yourself in Austria, I'll show you around and take you to the to the boot factory um love that. and yeah. at the very least we we should go make some turns but yeah um pray for thanks snow. for your time christoph yeah yeah well it's been a good start to the aussie season it's like best in 20 years or something so i think we're gonna have uh, have a good one here same with new zealand they're getting absolutely nailed so lots of skiing ahead thank you again for your time christoph and um yeah have a great summer Thank you. You too.